Hello, welcome back to another video. In this video, we talk about the Foreign Empress period of the Ruthian Empire. So as you saw in the previous video, we saw the rise of the Ruthian Empire. And as I said, it went into a war with Ordema. Now, we're going to be seeing the Ruthian Empire in its Foreign Emperor's period and then some of the aftermath. So, let's begin. For around a hundred years, the Ruthian Empire had dominated in the north of Dunaland, mainly defeating the Georgian Empire, which is located in this in the eastern part of Dunaland, as you can see by this mouse. However, in the meanwhile, there was another kingdom that was under the rise. That was the kingdom of Ordema, as you can see in this picture. Now, at first, it doesn't seem like the kingdom of Ordema would be much of a threat. However, they had a very large army pretty good population, and a smart leader. In the year 826 of the Second Era, Valsage Vas III conquered the city of Armor. After succeeding in assassinating the Emperor, Sia II, he marched into Gazmal and declared himself the Ruthian Emperor. He declared himself Emperor of Ordema and then brought the two empires into a union. In this period of time, he reigned mostly in Ordema, using Armor and Gazmal as massive taxation pots to fund his conquests. This made him very unpopular in the Ruthian Empire. So you can see here on this map that these two are split by sea, and so it's significantly harder for the people of Ordema to kind of dominate over the Ruthian Empire because they really don't have the best navy. And so you kind of see some resentment by the Ruthians due to the heavy taxation and the feeling that they are being dominated, not in a union, but essentially being dominated by the Valsage III. It takes me a second to kind of say these names, sorry about that. Valsage's reign. The Emperor Valsage reigned from 826 to 844. His reign was marked by instability and rebellion. So as you know, they were very unpopular in order when the Ruthian Empire. And so you see rebellions that's happened in the former Ruthian Empire to return it back. To give the Ruthian Empire independence. Many did not like his high taxes. And the fact that one of the most important things was that the elite class was dominated by the Ottoman Empire. Rather than people native to the land. So, one of the more important aspects about this, ironically for this, is race. You see, um, the Ordomans are what are called brown orcs. And their orcs, they're the color brown, but they have... It's a weird thing about the orcs. And these brown orcs are coming over to the Ruthian Empire, and they're dominating over the politics and everything. They're establishing, you know... And the people don't like that because they're foreigners coming to encroach on their soil and then soon enough declare it as their own. Not, you know, having the people already there ruling themselves in the name of the emperor or something like that. Which is pretty common for the time to do. So, in the year 844, Valsage would be assassinated and a man named Tivor turned the throne. However... He took his reign would be cut short when Tovminen took over. Tovminen, Tovminen, the Great, took over the Ruthian Empire in the year eight hundred and fifty-three. He did this by overthrowing Tivor. His justification being his claim to the throne and Tivor's competence. However, Tiv. Tovmenin was also the emperor of the Georgian Empire, and was a result of the marriage between a female from the Ruthian Empire and a male from the Georgian Empire, and thus why he was the emperor of the Georgian Empire already. With this, he gained a good enough claim to grab the throne, which eventually he did. He ironically favored the Ruthian Empire over the Georgian Empire, and gave great power to the Ruthian Empire. For one, he also made he made his t primary title the Ruthian Empire, not the Georgian Empire. So, <clears throat> some of the reforms he did were as follows: better in administration, he cut taxes, 
But one of the most important things he did was in the year 861, where he established a code of law, which was very important because now you could be punished for committing these certain crimes rather than, you know, people doing justice on their own. Now you knew what crimes to break. So, you know, a code of law existed in the land, which was pretty uncommon at the time. Expansion. However, his reign would not be really recognized for all of these accomplishments. Instead, he would be known for his massive territorial expansion. What made his expansion unique was that some of it wasn't filled by conquest, but rather through di diplomatic maneuvering and settlement, other than brutal conquests. In the year 859, he managed to move his way into the heir to the throne of the kingdom of Ordema, which had of course abolished the emperor thing after Valsage's death. Now, how was he able to do this? So, you see, when, the, when Valsage took over, he married a lot of the royal family into the other royal families of not just the Ruthian Empire, but of Joshu as well. This led to a lot of intermixing between the three royal families that eventually that would lead to him getting a good enough claim to the throne, and thus he'd be able to do this. He also secretly killed all the heirs to the throne, and thus made it to where he was the only possible heir to the throne. But, but let's not talk about that. Then he moved an army of soldiers into the Orklands, a huge region in the west. His armies were only able to take part in a small proportion of the orc lands but still this was a massive territorial expansion and gave great resources then such as metal mainly metal which was very important for the ruthian empire in the year 868 he took the title the king of ordema and essentially took over the kingdom of ordema from its people now, he did not make the same mistake as Valsage did. Valsage did. He let the locals kind of rule themselves more than, you know, Valsage did to them. And thus, he didn't face any major rebellions or major uprisings against his rule. Afterwards, he would go on to fight a war against a coalition of nobles like barons and mainly barons in the south of Gazmal. Then afterwards... This would give him a lot of territory. He also sent out many diplomatic and trade missions, which would be sent towards the de towards the empires around them, which was a lot. There was a lot of different kingdoms, empires, countries, but not really countries because that idea doesn't exist, but you get the point. And so here on this map, you can see kind of like the height of the Ruthian Empire at this time. So the Orc lands are here, where the mouse is. This whole area represents the Orc lands, most of it. But he was only able to take this because, you know, logistics and all. He also had Ordema here. And then he also expanded the Georgian Empire part slightly, kind of. And so this is kind of like the territorial height of the Ruthian Empire. It stretches all the way from the west of the continent to the east of the continent. And now, one of the more important things to note is um, this allows for them to essentially gain a lot of trading benefits. Because a lot of trade runs through these cities, especially from Vanza, which is located northwest of here. In order to reach uh, the Dunaland, ships would either have to go through the Straits and into here, or they have to go up. Either way, the Ruthians essentially dominated at least part of the way there and made great use of the trade areas to essentially get a lot of wealth from the trade. Decline. In the year 901, Tov Man Manin died. His heir succeeded him, and immediately was assassinated. This was succeeded by a civil war, lasting from 902 to 911. Welfast, 
nephew of Tolvmanen, wanted the thrones, while Tolvmanen's closest in line, Kroth, also wanted the throne. Tolvmanen attempted to make Welfast the second heir to the throne after his son, which was Welfast's justification to inherit the throne, while Kroth's um, justification was that he was the closest in line. And so the two fought each other until Kroth defeated Welfast in 910 and then finally defeated him in 911. During the Civil War, Ordemar managed to break away from the Ruthian Empire, but Joshu managed to stay. Joshu, by the way, refers to kind of like that area northwest. So, like, just this area northwest of kind of the mainland up here. Well, I should say northeast. You get what I mean. Anyways, let me catch up. And so, but two notable areas. So the Joshu and the Eastern Hagvan or clans managed to stay. In the year 918, Kroth experienced an uprising by Welfast, who he had spared after the First Civil War. In this war, Kroth would be killed, leading the Kroth II taking over. Kroth II managed to capture Welfast and tortured him to death. Afterwards, he took the thrones of Joshu and the Ruthian Empire. And so, fun fact, torturing rivals to death was a very common thing for the Ruthian Empire. Like, especially rivals. The Georgian Succession Wars Kroth II's reign was plagued by incompetence, and many thought of him as a mentally unstable man. In 928, he was coerced forced into signing a document, making the secession of the Georgian and Ruthian empires different. Once Kroth died of illness in 930, he was also very sickly from the beginning, and he was very young when he died. His two brothers gained the throne. Sia the third. <coughs> Sia the Third gained the Ruthian Empire, while Tolnik the Second gained the Georgian Empire. Sia the Third believed that his brother signing that his brother's signing of the Jopius, as it would become known, was illegitimate, and thus demanded the throne from his brother. His brother refused, leading to a twenty-year civil war. In nine hundred thirty-nine, Sia the Third died and was replaced by Sia the Fourth. After taking over the throne, he nearly decided to make peace, but decided to attack and managed to eventually defeat Tolnik in battle, finally torturing him to death and taking over the Georgian throne. In the year 961, the title of Emperor of the Georgian Empire was abolished, ending the Georgian Empire for good. So, the reason why he was able to do this was because he himself was the emperor of the Georgian Empire. Now, this move in and of itself was a very unpopular move and led to rebellions in kind of the former land of the Georgian Empire. However, at this point, he was so powerful, he was able to easily put down these rebellions. And the reason he wanted to do this was so that, like, in the future, there couldn't be another succession dispute where the Georgian and Ruthian Empire would separate. And thus, he used this opportunity to break, to destroy the title while he could. And why did these wars happen? So, heirs were never named during their life. So, you wouldn't just name someone an heir to the throne. No, usually the heir would have to take over after he died. Now, sometimes you'd have someone that would take the throne immediately, but there was no official naming of the heir, and so this led to many succession disputes. The army gained lots of money and power by the chaos, and so many of its leaders promoted the war. What I mean by this specifically is that the gigantic army could benefit from the wars due to the fact that the army kind of controlled its own economy, in a way, and so it wanted to gain a lot of money through conquest and wars. And when you couldn't conquer your neighbors, why don't you conquer your own lands for your own emperor in civil wars? 
And so they got a lot of money and power by earning this. And this actually leads to the rise of the army as a separate entity from the emperor, which kind of leads to problems for the dynasty in the future. Many corrupt people became emperors, which was a title with unlimited power. Essentially, just people who do not belong on the throne got the throne and kind of did whatever they wanted. Anyone with a powerful army could do what they wanted. So essentially, if you had a big enough army, you could storm into some place. And if you had a claim, you could even take the throne. Yada yada. Because remember, they don't never they never named any heirs. So if you kind of prepared an army and then the your emperor dies and then you succeed him, you might have to fight a brief civil war. But other than that, you have your throne secured. And then we talk about some changes during this period of time. With the adding of a code of law in the 800s, the Ruthian Empire began to stamp down on crime, in particular bandits. This saw a massive decline in the crime, though life was still hard, but bandits and barbarians and brig brigands and other people were becoming less and less common, though they weren't by far any near, anywhere near eliminated. Living standards improved despite the chaos. So this means like, you know, sanitary conditions and uh, just kind of like how like there's not as much poverty and people are able to grow more food and people can like kind of own more stuff for themselves rather than having to either have it be taxed or stolen. So that's what that means. The Ruthians were good trading partners when they were at peace, and thus made a lot of wealth. So the Ruthians are infamous for being some of the most famous and best traders, and Ruthian traders have been said to always make the best deals. And this kind of tradition of them, of being able to make good trade deals and having a lot of resources to trade for other resources, is why they became so wealthy. Because they were able to get needs that they either wanted or even needed. Or which would help them out significantly in whatever field they wanted. The navy began to rapidly expand. Now, the navy of the Ruthian Empire at first wasn't actually the best of the continent. You see, there's a whole series I'd love to do in the future. Which are called the Elven Wars. Where a series of... They're called the Elven Wars because they were fought between elves, but these wars that happened around the same time in the 800s were some of the worst naval wars in history, involving thousands of ships and hundreds of thousands of casualties, and there was a lot of naval fighting in these wars. If you'd like to see that in some future kind of like series, you let me know and I will definitely do it sometime. People served and ate more food due to the increase of surpluses in food supply. So people are growing more food. This leads to there being more food and with more food people eat more food and essentially the people are happier now. However this can eventually this will eventually come to bite them in the rear but not as badly as you think. Thank you all for watching very, very much. I appreciate each and every one of you spending a small proportion of your day or night to watch the videos I make. If you liked the video, make sure to like, subscribe if you'd like. Make sure to comment what you thought of the video, potentially suggestions, or what you thought of the videos, maybe even questions. Ch make sure to check my community posts, as I will usually off and on, but as frequently as I can make community posts about questions and quizzes and fun facts and you know that sort of stuff i really appreciate once again appreciate you all spending your time to watch my videos i hope you enjoyed it and i hope each and every one of you has a good day or night see you all another time